anniversary of 9-11 and the and the tragedy has reverberated from that event ever since. Um, at the moment, the last couple of days, I've been very preoccupied with um, my dear friends in Morocco. Um, and I feel, I don't like to say fortunately, none of them uh, um, were injured, but um, because that, there's so many were, were injured and died. But the people that I, that I, that I do know that, um, that, uh, that are there are very active in uh, the relief efforts. And we've started off, we've, we're working very closely with different organizations that are trying to help uh, those that have lost their homes um, and trying to uh, uh, create some kind of relief. So I just wanted to touch on that before I begin, because um, uh, I think it's important that we note those things. Okay, um, is it okay if I start sharing my screen? One moment, here we go. So, uh, here we go. I just returned from Jerba and Tunis, and it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful trip. In in uh, many ways, it's changed uh, um, the trajectory of my thinking. I've been fascinated by the Jewish people of Northern Africa and the influence of the Amazigh culture on them for some time. But this basically put things in a whole new perspective for me. And uh, I'd like to share uh, some of what I learned with you and uh, and also take you on uh, on a bit of an adventure that I had along the way. So um, I uh, started my trip a, a few weeks ago, three weeks ago now, from Hamburg, Hamburg, Germany, where I was with my family. And I, uh, I took a plane from Hamburg to Paris and then from Paris to Jerba, this island. And what I did not anticipate was that there was gonna be a couple of delays in my flights. And I ended up landing in Jerba, a very small airport in the evening and renting a car. And, um, and what happened uh, after that was uh, what I didn't realize is that Jer uh, Tunisia closes its does not allow ways to function within uh, within its country, and it also very and its Google Maps worked very very uh, it works but not very well. So as I was driving and it got steadily darker, Google Maps would take me it would say this is a highway and I'd go off into a dirt road, and I'd end up bumbling along, along on a dirt road in the middle of nowhere, getting darker and darker and without any headlamps. With uh, I looked around and saw jackals running by, and I said, what have I gotten myself into? At what point? At one point, I thought I was gonna have to pull off the side of the road, and just uh, and just go to sleep for a few hours till I got light again. But eventually, uh, uh, Google Maps got me to a, ma a, a, a main road, and that main road took me to my uh, that little little um, I guess inn where I was staying. So Jerba itself uh, fascinated me. Um, I guess I should have been prepared because it is an island, but I wasn't I wasn't prepared for this incredible diversity that I, that that uh, that I encountered. So it's a, it really is a mosaic of populations. Uh, throughout time, there's been a constant exchange with Libya, the Near East, the Western Maghreb, Southern Europe. And uh, as I wrote here, like lots of lonely sites that attract people seeking refuge, it's been a place that people could seek refuge in and also a place that they could hide away from others. And there's been a recorded Jewish population, record, like this is historically recorded, for over 2000 years. They themselves claim to have been there even longer and we'll get into that in a few minutes. So the, the Jerba that I encountered had Jews, Muslims, Berbers, and, uh, and the Jews, the Jewish community there developed in sync with this, these Muslim and Amazigh practices. And the Islam that I encountered in Jerba, this uh, Ibadi Islam was different than any other Islam I've ever encountered as well. So I was blown away in many, many ways. And, uh, and you see and you feel the, the influence of these different cultures on the Jewish population of Jerba, which I would say is overwhelmingly um, uh, practicing observant Jews. So that, that was, uh, so every restaurant is kosher. Every, every Jew that I met, uh, the, uh, considered themselves uh, um, religious, Shomer Shabbat. And so, uh, and yet, and yet the legends that they told me, their own stories and their own jewelry and their decoration and the customs you're gonna see reflect this long history I spoke of on the island 
and their adoption of these local German practices along with the Jewish traditions. And what I didn't know in Tunis that Tunisian Arabic, like every other dialect of Arabic across the world is always different than mainstream literary Arabic. And in Tunisian Arabic, the word for Berber is actually Jerbi. So in other words, the island itself was, was became the word in Tunisia to mean, to mean the, uh, the Berber Amazigh people. So uh, this is my drive part of it. I thought I, I took a screenshot and uh, I wrote here what I just told you about that uh, um, I was driving on sand and gravel and through desert. Eventually I arrived at my little room and uh, I went to sleep. And the next morning, oh, as you know, those of you who know me, I cannot uh, start any lecture without teaching you a local phrase, but today is not Arabic. Today I'm going to teach you a phrase in Amazir and uh, in Berber. But with, and I, so you have to speak these words because you cannot, so as I say it to you, try and practice saying it out loud. And uh, I showed you in my, in, or I showed some people in a recent lecture that the Amazi culture has their own alphabet. It actually is reflected in this painting behind me, but uh, that's another lecture. But it should be interesting for those of you that, that know that why are they writing Amazi language in Arabic? This is actually unusual. It shows you to the, the degree to which the, the, the rest of Tunisia, the Amazigh are only 1% of all of, of, all of uh, Tunisia, 1%. Uh, and yet on the island of Berber, they are, uh, there are many, many thousands. Uh, and they still speak Berber. Some three, three, three villages still speak only Berber. And yet, and yet they write in Arabic now. So uh, whereas, for instance, in Morocco, the majority of the population are actually Amazigh background. So to, for uh, the sake of contrast. So this expression that I'd like to teach you is, uh, it reflects my, my, my week in, uh, in Tunisia. The first, the first uh, sentence, the first word, or two words is, Ash Amadariul. Ash Amadariul means it's a little bit of a donkey. And the next line is, try and say it, Ash Amadariul. The next word is, or two words, Ash Amadjeda. It's a little bit of the road. And the final two words are Ash Amzandil. And it's a little bit of the saddlebag. And so is that whenever something goes wrong and they say, what happened? Whose fault is it? Uh, when they try and narrow down who, to whom the blame should be apportioned to, they say, you can't really apportion the blame to one person or one thing. It's a bit of the donkey. It's a bit of the road. It's a bit of the saddlebag. That just, that, I find idioms give you a sense of the culture. And I, and I thought this was a beautiful expression to share with you. The next morning I woke up, uh, I wandered central Jerba for an hour to meet, uh, I was eventually gonna meet my Amazigh gu uh, guide, Wajdi, who you're gonna see featured in a few of my slides to come. And I just, I, I want to get a smell and the taste of the place. Look at this woman. She isn't, she is a uh, Ibadi Muslim woman. And um, uh, her dress is unusual. You see how uh, compared to other Arab cultures I've seen in other places of the world or Muslim cultures. You see how she's wearing the white uh, uh, hijab under the straw hat. The, the Ibadi Islams and the Berbers are a matriarchal society. So the women uh, do a lot, have a lot of the power. They make a lot of the major decisions in the family. All the artwork and the paintings are done by Amazi uh, women. And uh, the ones who look after the mosques, uh, who feed the poor and take on major endeavors are women. And they feature a lot more prominently than other than other Islamic cultures, which I've studied. And a lot of it has to do with those that duality. The Ibadi Islam is unusual. It's a minority branch of Islam that broke off in the 1100s. In many ways, perhaps arguably the most democratic form of Islam I've witnessed. And uh, it's and they and they sought refuge on this island of Jerba. And in the middle, uh, while I, when I was uh, wandering, I saw uh, an Ibadi uh, Ibadi Muslim woman featured in the center of a, of a kika, of a, an island. And uh, I, can't, I can't focus, but if you look closely, you see the same garb, the same hat. And it's just, I, I found it fascinating this, this, that the this almost matriarchal society featured so strongly throughout Jerba. And of course you have the ubiquitous uh, people playing backgammon. And I found this, this one colorful building made me, uh, it was one of the first things that struck my eye in the morning when I was wandering. And it's just the, uh, people flying their falcons around, uh, holding them on their hands and setting them to catch things was something I found unusual. 
And the Ibadi Muslims who I just spoke about, they're descended, as I said, from this persecuted branch of Islam, uh, and they settled mostly in Jerba. And one of the reasons that, that really compelled me to take this leap to travel wasn't just because I was so privileged that I met Rafram, that was actually the main reason, but the fact that this, on this island, there's still Berber speakers, and there, uh, there are 7,000, what is it, total population of 75,000 people, there are 1,500 or 15,000 on the island. And um, they also have a black community who are the descendants of slaves in the 19th century. So I'm, uh, I found this, this is a very unique makeup if you can't tell in just a few short, uh, in a few short um, comments. We're gonna look at the communities, the different ones, the Ibadi and the uh, Berber. And we're gonna look at the synagogue, at synagogues. We're gonna look at the island and its Jews. And eventually we're gonna take this road trip together with me to Tunisia. And we're gonna keep in mind that our artist Rafram, the one we met, the one who is, uh, who is, um, who Shira will be going to visit in the near future, uh, he is from this place. And he moved to Tunisia, to the mainland and told me he had to escape in many ways this, this, this island that has formed him and made him. And, uh, and I found that fascinating in, the, in of itself. And when I finally saw his exhibition, I had not read Rafram's book about his art exhibition or his, or his uh, book launch. And yet the pictures I took and the things that, that fascinated me about Jerba were reflected in the exhibition. And I found that quite interesting. So uh, the, as I said to you before, the Jewish presence in Tunisia has a long history. Uh, there, there have been Jews who've been living there since 70 common era. The New Testament talks about uh, Jews uh, living in the area of Libya and Cyrene, North Africa. And uh, among Jerba's own legends, and this is one of the things that I spent my few days in Jerba doing, I talked to local Jews, uh, what language I spoke, uh, they speak Arabic. Uh, many of them speak in Arabic that I can speak the Fusa. They speak French and many of them speak Hebrew. And between those three languages, actually, I managed. And uh, among Jerba's own legends, the people told me that uh, they had a, members of the tribes of Israel, when, when Joshua apportioned the different territories, they weren't happy with it. And they left with the Canaanites who had been defeated and went to Egypt and then to North Africa and ended up in Jerba. These are their own stories. Another legend says they arrived there at the time of King David. They said one of David's generals pursued the uh, the Philistines, the Philistim, all the way to Jerba, where he founded his first Jewish community. And yet another version, and this one I think is actually quite plausible, has Jews arriving by sea, like the Phoenicians, at the time of King Solomon, around uh, his Solomon's reign, around the 11th century uh, before Common Era, to settle on the coast. And of course, this coincides with King, with king Hiram of Tyre, the same King Hiram that provided Solomon with the cedar for his first temple, for his second temple, uh, is the uh, first temple? Sorry, is the uh, is the uh, is the same King Tyre that set up the uh, the colony of Carthage in in Tunisia? I find that fascinating, and um, and I find and there and the and every Jew in Jerba will tell me that the there is a door of the temple and stones of the temple, either the first or the second, that are buried in the Geniza and part of the very foundation of their synagogue, which is ancient. And so uh, the reason why I showed you this, this, uh, these uh, little spots of purple here is the Phoenicians who, uh, who by trading brought the Greeks the alphabet. Uh, they also created this incredible colony of Carthage uh, that, and potentially they brought the first Jews with them there. And they were famous for uh, for creating this purple dye from the shell uh, from the, the shell of a of a of a sea snail, and this 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 dye was so um, expensive it was worth twenty five times its weight in gold, and they uh, and only royalty could wear it. You see a fresco of some people using it in in uh, in Pompeii in the fresco of Pompeii, and of course the tchelet of our of the tzitzit of the uh, of the uh, of the Jews uh, of the Jewish garment, uh, the talit has to be made with tchelet by by halacha by Jewish law, and uh, and the word the Phoenicians actually means the purples because they were famed for trading this dye. So we're we're intricately we're intricately connected <clears throat> with the Phoenicians and with Carthage and with Tunisia and with Jerba without even realizing it, and that these coins represent the the it's a Phoenician coin 
uh, from Carthage showing the traitors with the hippocampus under it. And I've heard local Jews talk about the Jews of Jerba refusing to follow Ezra the scribe to take part in rebuilding the temple. And the stories that they tell are so similar to the stories I heard from the Abadi Muslims who told me they took refuge in Jerba because their belief system differed from that of mainstream Islam. In fact, many Muslim scholars say the Abadi Islam that's practiced in Jerba is very, very uh, similar, if not the same, as the Islam that was practiced in, almost in the very beginning of Islam. So it's a very, uh, it's a very unique preservation, almost a fossilized culture uh, in the Muslim part and perhaps in the Jewish aspect as well. So uh, one of the things I noticed, even though they lost their alphabet, the Berber symbols predominate everywhere I looked. So this symbol, which I know from Morocco, Moroccan Berbers in the Amazigh is called the halala, this, this hook over here. And it's a pin used by Berber women to clip their dresses. And you see it, you'll see it reflected in carpets, in paintings, in, all, in jewelry, earrings, etc. And of course, uh, I wasn't culturally appropriating, I was culturally appreciating. I met a Jewish tailor named Yusuf, who I could only speak to with in Hebrew. And uh, he made me a, uh, a garment called a blusa, in which all German uh, uh, people wear in extremely hot weather. And um, let's see if I can find it. Here it is, I'm wearing it. And uh, behind me is my friend Wajdi, who is, who is Amazigh, who's Berber himself and became my guide, an indispensable guide. And the restaurants you see here, you can see my reflection taking the picture, are all uh, kosher. So you go inside. Uh, these are just regular. They're treated by the other German people, the Muslims and the, the, uh, the Abadi and by the Berbers as regular uh, German citizens. They're not, they don't differentiate. They all know each other. They talk to each other. And yet their restaurants are fully kosher. And uh, I had Greek, of course. I learned it from Rafram and more at Shea Gabriel. This guy's Gabriel, and he prepared the most amazing meal for me. Uh, we ate filfil michi, which is uh, a Tunisian omelet made with onion, garlic, parsley, and meat. He made me brik banatej. It's this meat, garlic, parsley in a ball and covered with a batter and fried. And then we went to these marketplaces. I was just basically, uh, these are the smells and tastes and, and uh, experiences I had in, in Jerba. I want to show you, uh, this is a show and tell as, uh, as Jirel calls it. So I saw these fish everywhere. And those of you that met, that met Rafram uh, and will follow uh, hopefully Shirel on her exhibition will know that fish feature predominantly in his exhibitions. Fish are also uh, a major sign to ward off evil in, in uh, Jerban society, and especially among the Jews, but also among the regular Muslims and Berber as well. So these fish you see there, I have right here. I don't know I, I, uh, if you can see it. I brought it back with me. They're delicious. You can actually eat them as they are. They flavor broths. And, you, and the difference between uh, the regular uh, uh, wazif that people usually buy is they're not shiny. If they're super, super shiny, it means that they were taken fresh and dried fresh. And the, and the taste is very special. So of course I purchased these small sardines. Uh, this is what they look like. And uh, I bought these small pickled hot peppers here with wild chives. And I've been eating it ever since. The food there is, is just something very, very special. And so, uh, and this is, the, this is the area I was walking around. It's known as the Hara Kabira. Kabira means big in Arabic, the large quarter. Now the Jews call this the Hara Kabira. And this is the area of the jewelry shops, of the tailors, of the, of the restaurants. And it's a, it's a very large, and the fish market, and it's a very large part of Jerba. You, you cannot avoid walking into it, by the, basically, when you're walking around. And this was from a mosque, actually. And it interested me because I've seen similar um, uh, depictions in synagogues as well. These, it looks like a menorah. In this case, it's supposed to reflect, I believe, a minaret of a mosque. And the holding of the, the, the fingers holding the fish, the fingers represent the khamsa against warding off bad luck. And the, and the fish they have, have many different origin explanations, which uh, I will not get into right now because I have too much to show you. So uh, then there's a smaller quarter where, where I actually lived, the Haras Ghira. You see over here, I'm circling the Hara Kabir where I bought the market. The Haras Ghira where I lived, Zghira in Arabic means small. The small quarter 
uh, is where the, the Jews, the most antique Jews live. This is where the synagogue is that they say houses the door of the first temple and the stones. And uh, and both, and they, it was renamed in the 70s. Uh, the Haraz River and Har Kabir was, was the Jewish designation. And I guess the powers that be there didn't want it to be only Jewish. So they, they nicknamed it, they nicknamed it Ariad, which means the gardens at the Haras Vira, and the Haras Kabira was named Essewani, the orchards. And what I, what I liked was that the Jewish people only refer to it by the Jewish names, the Haras Vira and Haras Kabira, and the cab drivers uh, uh, alternate, they use both. So I've, this, this switch of language and culture, the idea of, of having a Jewish presence that's acknowledged on one level and not acknowledged on another, I found meaningful. So after exploring the Hara Kabira with, with Wajdi, with my guide, I started to make my way to the Ibadi Coast Mosque. Here we go. So the Ibadi, these are, this is a typical Ibadi Mosque. They're unusual because they're shaped to blend in with the earth. Because they were persecuted for so many uh, centuries, by the, also, not just by other Muslims, but also by the Crusaders, they developed a type of Islam where their mosques kind of blended into the mountains and into the landscapes. And they weren't painted white the way they are now. They were actually camouflaged, but with local colors. So you kind of pass by them and not really notice them. And these mosques, as I said before, are maintained by women. So every evening they bring flour, yeast, sugar, uh, and, and create food for visitors. And women make all decisions related to the upkeep and running of these mosques. So Jerba uh, itself has 372 mosques within a 514 square kilometer radius. And ironically enough, they don't feel, um, how, how do I put this delicately and not without prejudicing myself? They're very uh, receptive and welcoming uh, of all, to all cultures and to all faiths and all ways of thinking and all dress. Uh, so you're, you, um, it's a very different, I had a very different encounter with this than I expected. Um, here is, a, I took a brief video of the woman looking through. see what Wajdi is talking about, the women who are taking care of the communities. That's one. And then I went to bed. I went home, had an amazing day. And uh, I went to visit uh, the, uh, the Griba synagogue next. The Griba synagogue is something that uh, I think you will all find fascinating. It's, it's story, it's history, and it's multi-layered uh, origin stories. Griba, by the way, uh, uh, in, in Arabic, Garib or Garib means stranger. So it's basically the synagogue of the stranger. And that in, that in itself is an intriguing name, the Griba synagogue. It's also the place that, that, that suffered the two terrorist attacks. Uh, one of them, unfortunately, very recently. The other one in the, uh, was it the 2000s, early 2000s. So every spring, thousands of Jews from Israel, Europe, and North Africa make a pilgrimage to Jerba to visit this Griba synagogue, which is also the oldest synagogue in North Africa. The word griba doesn't only refer to the synagogue, which it, uh, it also refers to a young woman. Gariba is feminine for stranger. And she is described in so many legends that are popular among Jews and Muslims alike in Jerba that I had the time of my life asking everybody to tell me their story of the griba. So uh, imagine she's, she's perceived as a Jewish woman and um, uh, I'll tell you more about her in a moment, who, uh, who, who died and was buried there. And both Muslims and uh, Jews make pilgrimages to the synagogue. So uh, during this pilgrimage, which dates back to the 18th century, if not earlier, Jews gather and stay at the synagogue for four days. And they celebrate the griba, not the woman, but the, the story of the synagogue as this ancient uh, um, part of the houses, a part of the temple, that has two famous Jewish tzaddikim rabbis who died, uh, who were rabbis there and died in the second century. And these pilgrims come, they light candles, they have ceremonies in which they take this giant light called this menorah around. And they parade to these streets in celebration of the, of the Jewish people, because Muslims also take part of this connection to God. So I wrote here, this, this is when I entered the courtyard. This is the courtyard where people actually stay. This is the, it was first laid according, this is by the way, I should have written these in, in according to local belief. It was first laid in 586 BCE 
with a stone or door brought from Solomon's temple. The men who founded the synagogue were Kohanim. They actually are all, almost all Kohanim, which is interesting. High priests who fled the Babylonian destruction of the first temple. So much of the local inhabitants are also Kohanim. This is what it looks like during the celebration. I, I took this photo, I, I credited it from, uh, from uh, archival footage uh, during this festival. And this is when I walked inside the, uh, the, actual, uh, the actual synagogue for the first time. I walked in, it was my first view. And I saw this gentleman sitting here, this gentleman over here with his yarmulke will figure very, very prominently in an in a incredible discovery that I made. And, uh, and he played a key role in this discovery. So I walked over to him. Uh, first, I had to light a candle. If you notice, because of the Islamic influence, Everybody is barefoot in the synagogue. Uh, most of them actually don't even have their socks on them, their bare feet. And I, I have my socks. I'm lighting a candle, a uh, memorial candle. And this gentleman here, um, I went to him and asked him for a blessing. And after I gave him the blessing, he asked me for a donation for the synagogue. And then I remembered that I'd forgotten to uh, get a blessing for my family. So I went back to him and asked him for a blessing for my family. <laughs> Uh, my brother is here. I, I stood on the on the um, bima because my brother's name is Yosef. It's behind me in the synagogue, and. Uh, and this legend of the Griba becomes more relevant in a moment. I want to add a little bit to it. I've collected, I collected nine versions already, each one a bit different than the other. It's a young foreign woman arrives by sea to the island of Jerba, and she's ignored by the, by, the, uh, by the local community. Both Jews and Arabs don't really accept her. They don't treat her well. They suspect her of sorcery. They don't interact with her. And when her, when her hut one day catches fire, she's left just to burn to death without any help. And when the people come after the hut is burnt down, they find her body perfectly preserved, and they decide she's a saint. And they bury her in the place of the synagogue, and they hope that they'll be forgiven for not having treated her well during her lifetime. And after her burial, anybody who visited her said that they had been healed of whatever ailed them. And they built a shrine, which today is believed to be the grotto underneath there where the Torah Ark is of the Griva synagogue. And I want to add, my last line on this page is, isn't it wonderful to think that the word griba means an outsider. It means a stranger. And she becomes a saint. And I think in many ways it reflects the island mentality. The idea that minorities get protected here. You escape other places. And here you can actually, uh, you can actually uh, live your life. And this one person who they did not let her live her life properly and ignored her. She became the person who they turned to as a symbol of, of what they stand for. Both Muslims and Jews. And I found that very profound. Uh, this is inside the synagogue. I like to see again the symbol of the fish. Uh, Tzion Kodesh, they have names. Um, and everywhere you see with these plaques that date back uh, from the 19, well, relatively recently, going back uh, a few hundred years. And people slip notes like in the like in the Western Wall, like in the Kotel. They slip in wishes for blessings, um, um, wishes for good luck, et cetera, wishing with blessings for others. And female pilgrims to the Griba synagogue visit the grotto under the Aron Kodesh. There's a hole that goes deep down where they light candles and they place eggs inscribed with wishes. Now, this egg business, I asked them how far back it goes and they said hundreds of years. Uh, so it'll remind you of something else. According to, to tradition, a woman, if a woman eats the egg after she's inscribed it, her wish for love and fertility and good fortune will be fulfilled within a year. And Jews who come to the Griba promise to return to visit this, uh, this, uh, this saint when their prayers are answered. Uh, and it's very similar to Islamic pilgrimage uh, promises and traditions in which you say, if my wishes are granted, I will come back and give an offering. So I found this, out, this annual pilgrimage that has now grown. You'll re, you'll, those of you that, uh, many of, of you have probably been aware of it, probably became aware of it because of the recent tragedy. But uh, this reinforces their Jewish identity and also they're belonging to the German culture as well. Something different and yet something very Jewish. Uh, this is the actual grotto on the bottom. When you open those doors, you go down into the place where they believe the Griba is buried and where the women go down. Uh, this I took off the internet. I, I credited the photographer. 
so you can see the construction. Uh, behind the lamp is the door to the grotto. This is a girl, her, I met, her mother uh, gave me several pictures. I became friendly with her now on this trip. And her daughter is inscribing the egg with all the bl blessings and wishes. You can see Hebrew uh, as well. And they get put at the bottom. Look at this. Deep inside that hole by under the Oran Kodesh. And here you have the uh, these many, many eggs from all of the pilgrims uh, being placed there. Uh, this this fellow Wajdi, you can see the man. Look at them. First of all, look at all the people in their bare feet inside the synagogue. Look in the background. You see this Muslim woman is inside as well. And this is a typical scene in the synagogue. It's not for tourists. It's, tourists also go there, but this is a place you come to pay your respects. So what I found fascinating here is Wajdi, my friend, my guide, who's standing here in his bare feet. He is he is a Muslim. He's interacting with these Polish people, who ask who said their 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 family they. Uh, they felt very curious why Muslims can feel so free and so close to a synagogue, given, and they said it's very touching for them given the history in Poland and the, the horrors that, that they see the Polish people visited upon the Jews. I was just listening. I didn't even say I was Jewish. I was listening to talk to Wajdi. And that for me was a very beautiful moment to have Polish Christians speaking with an Amazigh Muslim, uh, with a Muslim and with a clearly Muslim woman from another country in the background, all of them uh, inside a synagogue. I went back to my room and I visited Tifaha. This woman here uh, owns a kosher restaurant, but she invited me for lunch inside of her kitchen. And she told me a story of a school uh, with a, a, a sister where a great wise tzaddik, a holy, a holy man who could work miracles lived. And he had a, a house of judgment, a Beit Din, that was on the second floor and a synagogue. And it's been closed off for 30 years. So I said, can I please go? And they all laughed at me. They said, do you know how many people asked to come here? We never let anybody go, but sweet of you to ask, you know, very cute. And more on this later. So I, uh, at 2.30 PM, I met Wajdi again, and we took off for the, for the uh, des deserted parts, uh, seemingly deserted parts of Jerba. Took a way, way, way out, I guess an hour drive. Jerba is a big island. And I wanted to show you this underground mosque, this Ibadi style of Islam was, uh, they, they really lived in fear for centuries and they created this type of protection for themselves here. Go, okay. So as uh, my friend Wajdi has been explaining to me and now I will try and share my knowledge with the rest of you. This is an Ibadi mosque, an underground mosque. It's meant to uh, be, I guess, the first line of protection uh, starting with the uh, Crusades and further invaders due to its, uh, its persecution by other forms of Islam as well, Sunni, uh, etc. So it, was, it became very important to practice your faith and hide it. So they built these mosques that were both not just underground, but also this white is very deceiving. It originally was camouflaged the local colors so that anybody passing by would just see a, a beautiful uh, olive orchard in the middle of nowhere. You have to actually come very close to actually spot this underground mosque, and we will visit together and we will explain to you its real significance. Thank you. Here we're going down into the mosque. So. Wow. So what's fascinating about this about this underground mosque is they, uh, for, as I said to you before, it's not only that um, that is tended to and looked after by by women. The uh, the imams who practice there, it's uh, it's a democratic type of Islam. So this Amir Rab, by the way, is that niche in the wall that that shows the Muslims the way towards Mecca, so they know which way to pray. So inside the niche, the, uh, the Imam would come. And the second one was just for a fellow Imam who, they would, or any, if he just wanted to be there as well, not to have any sense of hierarchy. So they make it exactly the same size right next to the other one. And uh, I found it very charming. So uh, inside here, these are, they, they are next to each other. Over, them, over the mosque in Arabic, it says Muhammad. Uh, in Arabic here, 
On the other side, it says Mabruk. And there's all these blessings in Arabic that uh, that basically would normally be in a in a regular mosque with uh, bright, you know, written with beautiful mosaics, uh, beautiful paintings. Like you, you've probably seen these intricate, gorgeous mosques. This for me, this the idea that the worship still happened in a very subdued, quiet, camouflage setting. Uh, I, I found it quite quite fascinating. Uh, inside here, inside the mihrab, you actually have offerings of olive oil and. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the type of spice this was. I believe it's uh, it's a type of oregano that they uh, that they're left there to purify, to look after, to take for uh, uh, as a sign of respect. And it's uh, and I asked my friend, is it kind of like an offering? Like, a, isn't that considered like some kind of idol idolatry? And he said, no, it's not an offering. It's there as a sign of of respect to show it's being looked after, taken care of, tended. So uh, this was this was one of the many intriguing things about about these this. Ibadi faith. This is what it looks like from the outside. And look at this picture here. Isn't that amazing? Uh, actually, it probably won't surprise many of you to know that um, George Lucas filmed much of Star Wars <laughs> inside structures that look like these in Tunisia on Jerba uh, because of, uh, because, uh, and he, he, it influenced a lot of his Star Wars uh, uh, lore as a result of this, uh, this unique type of architecture. And we left the underground mosque. And we made our way to unique structures. So the as the Abadis became more entrenched and more secure and more confident in their type of Islam, it became less hidden. And here is a, a mosque that's actually more uh, it stands out a bit more. This one is my friend Lunchdi was holding the camera. He went to a very this little uh, fields to show you the first version of a mosque. The Ibadi system of Islam is very modest, very low key, and it first starts as a monument like this. The first, a very simple a hermit lived alone. Uh, he was a holy man. He prayed on behalf of his community, of his people, and lived here alone and communed with uh, with Allah, with God. So, uh, if you look inside, show them inside. You will see the, the bare simplicity with the uh, mihrab, with the Venetian uh, wall that points to Mecca and to the direction of prayer for Muslims. Merci. Merci. Here we go. And have another look at it. And then when you go outside, uh, I wanted you to also to think about the fact that. Much of of the way the Jewish, uh, the recent Jewish tra uh, traditions of of going to the monuments of people who have passed away, of great righteous people, and praying there, uh, is believed to have gained its uh, have gained its um, its start from uh, Moroccan or North African Jewish practices, and you see something similar here, where the the holy site of uh, of a great of a great righteous person. People will come to to pray, but the regular burial grounds are treated with very little veneration. You you remember the person who passed away with love, with respect. You remember you you have uh, you have a month a yearly tradition where you remember you talk about them very similar to ours. You uh, you uh, but you do not pray at their graves. In fact, the graves are taken so lightly that uh, they're buried with no ceremony whatsoever. Holy tombs are not perceived as a place of death at all, but as a place that housed a, a righteous person. So this is a grave actually right here between the two bricks. And I, had, I asked my friend Wajidi to actually uh, present because he's this is an area of his study to talk about it. And it's right here, next one. Probably there is no veneration for the dead or the sand or anything like this. So this is why the tomb, it's 100% eco-friendly. Uh, there is no construction inside. You just bury your dead, and after two half year, three years, there is nothing. It's deleted. Oh, this is a graveyard. You will notice only the new grave, like this one. It can be like one one year, two years old, three months, something like this. But after one year or two, it's been deleted with the graveyard. Bury another one. Because there is no room down. It's linked to the earth. I found this fascinating. It's very, uh, you can see it's, it's, it looks like a field in the middle of nowhere. Everyone is aware that it's a cemetery. You don't, you won't build upon it. Uh, but they, they bury, they let, they let the bodies, uh, 
decompose naturally within the earth and then they bury on top of it after a couple of years. We then visited, you see how the mosques are slowly developing. This is, a, this is an Ibadi mosque that became a school as well. And this guy, Sheikh Samir Satur, is a descendant of the original holy man who founded the mosque. And he showed us both the mosque and his mausoleum. And I actually got him to uh, do the, uh, the, uh, the prayer, the call to prayer for me as well, even though it wasn't the time, because I wanted you to hear how an Ibadi Muslim does it. I found it quite beautiful. This is going inside his, uh, inside the actual mausoleum. Again, very modest. And this is inside the mosque itself, the very small mosque. And here he is singing for me. That gives you the idea. So we continued uh, our drive back to central Jerba. And on the way, YGD explained to me in fascinating aspects of Jerban society. And he, he kept talking about Manzal to me. And I finally said, what is a Manzal? And he said, okay, let's stop by a Manzal and I'll show you. So he pulled off the side of a road. And basically what they do is they harness a local spring and well, and they water uh, an entire area and they, they grow these large palm trees for shade uh, and a lot and fruit crops and vegetable crops, and they base the whole family life around it. And I asked him to speak about this as well, one moment. So the manzal is based on having this palm oasis that actually they plant to have enough shade to create three level olive tree, uh, pomegranate tree, orange tree, everything like from citruses and everything. And after there is any uh, bushes and small trees and then you have those uh, elements like um, vegetables and potager, you know, all the, the things that we grains to eat and, uh, and beans to uh, sell for the market. So, there you go. That's the manza. And then here's my theory about the kitchen. So you saw the first picture. She kind of, I didn't, I wasn't really in yet, but it turns out that Tefaha, this woman here, her brother was the guy who gave me the blessing in the synagogue. And she was her, and then when she realized that, she called him and he remembered me and remembered my donations. And uh, and then she invited me for a private meal inside her kitchen. And my theory about traveling and the kitchen, uh, which you will, any of you who get to know me well will hear me quote endlessly, you have not really arrived in any new place in the world until you're in somebody's kitchen. That's the place where the secrets are told, the gossip is related, and you truly are a part of the home. And it's where it's the it's the uh, engine of the house, of the, of the home, of the community. So uh, so I was in there and she gave me this homemade fig alcohol, which is delicious. It's right here. If any of you want to have a l'chaim with me, uh, you're welcome to join me. I'm not going to do it right now. Otherwise, I won't finish my lecture. And uh, she made, gave me, uh, not only did she feed me well, she gave me food for the next day for my further travels through Tunisia. And then when I asked about one more time about this synagogue, about this hidden place, she kind of hesitated. And her daughter uh, standing over me over here, Vered, and uh, her cousin uh, said, why don't you let him in? Why don't you show it to him? And uh, so uh, uh, she said, what, everything? And he goes, yeah, sure, let him see the upstairs. And I said, what's the upstairs? And she says, the upstairs nobody goes to. That's the holy place. So I was like, wow. So uh, Vered was given the key and she was really excited because she hadn't been there either. And her daughter came along as well. And I got to discover this place that had been closed for over 30 years. And you'll, I'll, let me show you what I found. First of all, this is Naomi. This is the girl with the eggs. You remember the one who buried it at the bottom? That's the picture of her. This is kind of a courtyard. This is the same kind of uh, system of university that dates back to the oldest universities of the world. This way of the system of studying these pillared columns where you can sit inside this kind of um, colonnaded uh, rooftop for shade and you sit and you learn and you study. It was basically yeshiva. And, uh, and then we went inside and we started pulling blankets and sheets off of things. 
and we found some incredible treasures. Some books uh, that I was reading from, there was like, there was Mishnah, Gomorrah, mystical works, mystical texts. I was in heaven. And I just, uh, they let me, they let me spend time there. And I just, I was almost crying. I was overcome. Uh, and why is the color blue everywhere, by the way? That relates to my earlier story with the Phoenicians. Because Techelet, this, this Jewish, this color for our tzitzit and the same color as the Israeli flag is perceived as a holy Jewish color. It's the color of the Jewish people of Tunisia. So everything is painted in this kind of turquoise blue for good luck uh, as part of our Jewish tradition. And it all reflects back to the fact that by halakha, we have to actually color or dye our own tzitzit in this as well. Here's Vered explaining about the history of the school, synagogue in Beit Din. She's speaking Hebrew, but I want you to hear her voice a little bit. She said, there in, she said in this area, there used to be many Jews. Now there's only five families in, uh, in the small Jewish community of Harazrira. So... Uh, she, also, she goes on to explain about the people who studied there and the fact that the person who lived on the second floor, the two the rabbis there were miracle workers. And one of them uh, was so, uh, when he would speak and he'd give lectures, even on a very hot day, she said the vessels of water would freeze. And there's a lot of people who speak about the fact that as they, they would hold water in their hands, they would turn to ice, like inside a vessel, inside a cup. So uh, nobody was ever allowed to go on the second floor. So they let me go on the second floor. I, I went on the rooftop went higher. And this, this guy, Rabbi Braham, you see it's, it's, Ar it's actually Arabic from Ibrahim, and Rabbi Murid Cohen was known for his miracles. And Rabbi Moshe Cohen was the head rabbi and the judge, the shofet, with another rabbi, Rabbi Zakin, on the second floor where I am right now. I, this flag you see there that says Gabis on it, I pulled it out of the, uh, out of the uh, Ark of the Covenant, out of the, out of the uh, Aron Kodesh, and she actually let me take it, which I thought was very touching. I'll, I'll, you'll see another picture of that later. So here's some of the books that I uncovered. And uh, I have a lot of photographs. She let me photograph a lot of the books. That, that is a mashu. Wow. These are very old books. Nobody can come in here. <laughs> Other people wanted to come and take the books, <laughs> and we didn't let them. And I said, of course not. This is where we taught the students. Turns out it wasn't true. That was the Beit Din. So that gives you. So that was that was my day there. And uh, before I before I uh, finish the story, I'll tell you that they've called me now, Vered and her mother, to say that there's other people that want to have access to the library and they want me to have the access. And if I'm interested in going there, learning from the books, studying them, and researching from them, I'm the one, that, the only one they'll get permission to. And I thought that was very touching. And again, it all links back to the kitchen and asking for blessings. And it was a very wonderful moment of my trip for me, one of my highlights, I would say, if not the highlight. I slept very deeply. The next morning, I took my trusty car and I took the ferry and left Jerba for mainland Tunisia. And I drove all the way once again until midnight until I reached Sfax. Uh, here I'm saying goodbye on the boat. And this is the road I took. See, this is the, the island of Jerba. I crossed over. And these drives were just magnificent. Like I, I would do the whole trip just for the driving, the, the things that I saw, the stops that I made. It's just, uh, it's, I highly recommend it. It was really something. And my impressions of Sfax is that just like in Morocco, for those of you that have been there, every city has its own Medina, its own, its own old part of the city, but it's not very touched by tourism. So you go inside and it's really just you and the locals. So I would just, I, I wander, I only had a few hours there because I went to sleep and drove to Tunis the next day. But I was really, uh, I, I, I want to go back basically and explore more. Uh, again, this incredible fusion of language, culture, and surprisingly, um, again, I hesitate to use these words, but very accepting uh, of different ways of thinking. It's the first place I've ever heard many people speak about intermarriage between Muslim women and Christian men as something that happens. They don't see it as the end of the world. I can't say this is the commonplace thing, but I heard it from four or five people already, which I've never heard from in other countries either. There were several things, and the dress, of course, is, as you can probably see, is, is more liberal. Other people dress up in more traditional garb. Other ones don't. But it's, uh, and it comes from within. And I'm, uh, I'm curious to explore the reasons for this. Uh, again, it's, uh, it's also a new country for me.
but it was really, don't forget, by the way, the Arab Spring originated from Tunisia. The whole idea of liberating themselves from, uh, from the Hamula, from the, this uh, idea of tradition started in Tunisia as well. Uh, I don't think we should forget that. So uh, these are some photographs I took uh, in Sfax. Um, just to give a few quick impressions. Look, those are the, these things that the flag I was given from the Aaron Kodesh turns out to be a, uh, I asked as a fan for hot weather. <laughs> I thought that was funny. So um, I then drove from Sfax to Tunis three hours and realized as I was driving that I was actually driving to Carthage. It just blew my mind. The idea that um, this is where I'm going to have my final stop and we're going to meet Rafram for his book launch and the opening of his art exhibition, which uh, Shirel will be covering in depth at the end of this month. So I'm driving now and I'm, I'm saying I'm driving to Carthage. I'm driving to a place where uh, where the, these Phoenicians set up, a, set up a colony, a people with whom the Jews, King Solomon bought the cedar from for his temple, a people that, that had that that uh, traded in Tehelet, that had a, that created an empire that rivaled that of Rome to the point that Car the whole story of Hannibal and Carthage started from there. And I was really, uh, I was just, I was overcome as I was driving to think about that. Uh, when I reached, when I got into the Carthage, I was on Avenue Carthage. And I thought about how history is perceived differently depending on wherever anyone travels. It, it seems obvious perhaps, but when I was raised, uh, it's not that the, it's not that the, people from Carthage and Hannibal were seen as the bad guys, but it was somehow portrayed as they were the, the barbarians. And yet here you see they came from a very developed civilization uh, and the Tunisians are rightly very proud of this, of this, of this, uh, of their origin. Uh, and yet I couldn't find any memory of these Punic people and their Semitic language uh, and Hannibal, I just saw Roman ruins. So I called it a, a true attempt at nemocide by the Romans. Like the Romans just came there, built, and yet the story of Hannibal and Carthage is still predominates, and it's and it's the it's the story and the founding myth of many Tunisians, especially in this area of Tunis, that they that they speak of very proudly. This is uh, one of the few areas this an inside port that was built by the uh, Carthaginians to hide their boats and their navy from. Uh, from other other ships, including the Romans, so that when they would come close, they'd think it was an undefended port, and the military boats would come piling out. So this is the only um, the only true uh, image of the real Carthage that I received. Inside the old city itself, where I was parked, uh, I don't know if you can tell how narrow it is inside here. Uh, you see the reusage of Roman columns everywhere you look uh, to help prop up this this old city of of, uh, of Tunis, the Medina, and I and I stayed there. Uh, I didn't realize how hard it was going to be to stay there. Every day I got stuck with my car. I couldn't leave because the, ro the roads are very narrow. And I'd have to ask the local to sit in the car with me and get me out so I could go and drive to mainland, uh, main part of the city to visit Rafram. So yeah, you could, this, I had to drive on all these roads here basically. And then I made my way to Rafram, which is about, a, I guess, a half an hour, 20 minute drive from where I was. And... Uh, I, I, I walked inside and I didn't know this. Maybe Shirel can tell, probably knows it better than I do. I didn't know how, how artists don't like people coming in on their show just before they, they're about to have set up a shop. See, he saw me and he ran to me as fast as he could. He, see, he, he joked, he covered my eyes. He goes, no, you see it afterwards like everybody else. And he took me out and we went for a wonderful lunch. And uh, here's Rafa, I'm still on the phone. He shouldn't have, been, he had no business going for lunch with me. He had an exhibition to open up and a book launch, but we had a nice chat. And... Here is, uh, again, one of his depictions of the, uh, of the fish, of this chamsa with the fish. And um, in his, and later on, I went to his actual exhibition to the opening. And what I found fascinating is everywhere I showed you all these imagery, these, uh, these totems, these amulets against bad luck. And Rafram is aware of that. And he has the mezuzah stuck inside the wall. Uh, he actually chips at the wall and puts it inside and puts a frame around it. And... Uh, and the book about the exhibition itself, uh, if we can play show and tell, looks like this. It's an actual uh, book telling the story of the art. The book itself is a work of art. But he gave me an additional present, or actually uh, uh, you guys gave me an additional present from the OCSP, so thank you. And this book is an actual mezuzah inside a book. And 
It David, made me, David yeah. can you lift it a little more so people can see more clearly? Because it was. A I little... wonder. I wonder if I can stop sharing for a moment so I can do this. Yes, um, we're also. I'll also just mention that we're it. Uh, we're uh, two minutes before um, our hour. You can go overboard. Don't worry. But I'm just uh, making make, making you aware of the times, and we can go a little over the time. Okay, so I want to show you. Thank you, Shira. I'll be careful. I'll be. Uh, I'll try and be careful. But I want to show you that that just like the library that I found, in which the books are not meant to be touched by anybody, they're just meant to be. They're holy in, into itself. They're they're assigned. People aren't even allowed to go into the building to see the books. They're so they're so rare. So Raphram uh, is aware of that, and he creates this book. Uh, his book, The Seven Good Years. He, he created a second book called The Seven Good Years, and in the book itself, he puts a Mezuzah, can you see it like this, or should I hold it more? Yes. And I found that a very interesting and unique um, acknowledgement. And then Raphram, as part of one of my presents he gave me, was a book printed by his grandfather in Jerba, who had a printing press. And it's a book for Yom Kippur. And again, the fact that he gave me the book, I assume he knew I probably wouldn't be praying out of it. And again, it's the symbol of it. And I will actually try and use it, because it's something this, for me, there's something that rankles me, and at the same time, it's being beautiful. The idea that the mezuzah is a written word. It's a Shema Yisrael, hero Israel, and nobody ever sees it or reads it. It's, it's, and again, this idea of the book. And in Jerba, for the first time in my life, I saw something else too. The Quran, which is usually meant to only be read, they have, can you see this too, Shirel, or should I show it differently? No, no, we can see it. They have a little Quran holder. I can't see myself, that's why. They have a little Quran holder, and they have a little mini Quran. Very tiny. I've never seen that before. So it's 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 interesting. I think in this in this case, I believe the the Muslims of Jerba took the Jewish tradition uh, idea of a book as an amulet, as a, as a, as as holy unto itself. And uh, even though they, they do see the Quran as holy unto itself, of course, but they they took it as a symbol, and that 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 symbolism fascinated me, and I'm still I'm still intrigued by it. I'm not a I'm a it the, as you can tell the whole. This whole aspect, uh, strangely enough, without realizing Rafram's exhibition, reflected on my trip from the fish that I bought in the market and ate. And you're going to see in a moment, if I can go back to my sharing screen. Uh, one moment. Here we go. Uh, here we go. Uh, am I full screen or not yet? Am I full screen, Shira? Shira, can yeah. you see this? Okay, good. So there I, I reached up the mezuzah in my shadow. I thought that would be kind of... It was kind of corny, but I thought I would do it anyway. And look there. Here you have the fish in the, kind of in an aquarium that's meant to be eaten. It's also part of the uh, it's also part of the of the tradition. If you know Rafram, he paints these fish all the time for people on their houses as amulets, as amulets, as kind of mezuzah, as uh, against bad luck, again uh, and for good luck. And this car was a car that was actually used to drive people from Jerba to the ferry to the mainland. And it reflects it reflects that journey as well. So again, without realizing it, uh, here we have a black member of the German society uh, on video showing how she prepares her peppers. And this is something that Shirel will get into in more depth later. This is a mosaic of the woman that prepared it. And instead of, and this I can show without any fear of stepping on Shirel's toes, instead of the usual uh, wine and cheese, we had uh, this delicious fricassee and Bucha and uh, and uh, fig liquor. So this is what it looks like. This is just before the book launch. Everyone was happy. The kids were able to play and eat those fricassees. And this is what they look like. I didn't, that's a picture I took from somewhere else, by the way, but that's what they look like. And it's actually a Tunisian, what we call a Tunisian sandwich. Don't call it Israeli food or Rafa will get very angry. It's Jewish Tunisian food. And instead of wine, we drank bucha. This is my, this is actually my bootleg stuff, but they had, they had, he had really good high quality bucha there, but I had to have a picture. And I chose this actual tablecloth that I have right now because it has fish on it, which is just a coincidence. And here's Rafa, I'm signing the book to me. Uh, this is part of the exhibition. And I found this, this is, I found the birdcage in the cemetery very interesting for those of you that saw my interview with Rafram about his time in prison. 
I, uh, I it kind of reminded me of that. And I just thought I would include his uh, something I saw on his Instagram at Milaf. He's at Rafran, the local guide uh, for for the prisons in Libya. He goes, the food is not great. Well, it's not accessible. It's a very bad attitude from the guards. No Wi-Fi. So here he is at his book review, uh, which was really beautiful. Very uh, A lot of wonderful questions. It was very, uh, very friendly, very warm, and not stuffy at all, because Rafram is not stuffy at all. And that's the end of my uh, of my presentation. Here we go. And I'm ready for questions and thoughts. David, thank you so, so much. That was fascinating. Um, I'll mention, first of all, for those of you who are uh, curious, uh, the follow-up email will also include all previous conversations with Rafram, so you can know a little more about what David uh, was mentioning, and also a link to the future program where I'll be visiting Tunisia and going deeper into the exhibition and the art itself. Uh, David, I do want to share with you uh, just a couple of comments uh, rather than the questions that I found very uh, beautiful. So Jonathan Dauber uh, mentioned that fish, the word uh, fish in Tunisian Arabic is also also means mazaltov, which I didn't know and is very mm -hmm. beautiful. And we had here Stephen mention after you showed the call for prayer that it did sound very different from the Sunni call to prayer. So you have here some uh, avid listeners with a good uh, uh, ear and knowledge, which is beautiful. Uh, I had here a question uh, about, you mentioned uh, intermarriage between Christians and uh, and Muslims. Are there, were you aware of any intermarriages between uh, Jews and Muslims or are, is the Jewish community keeping very much to, to itself? That's, uh, I was told the German Jewish community keeps very much to themselves. Uh, in fact, the family I became close with gave me these dire warnings how not to trust uh, if they said, even though our friends are Muslim, just don't trust them. Be very careful, be very cautious. Uh, but I don't think they reflect the Jews across Tunisia. I think it's German Jewish culture is very unique. And uh, the people I spoke with were from Tunis, the ones who had those relationships. But I asked my friend Wajdi afterwards, who is a practicing religious Ibadi Amazigh Muslim. And he told me that this type of open attitude, if it would be, uh, the families always have a hard time with it, but they accept it. He said, it's not that they're easygoing, that they're, everything's lovely. He said, but they're, they don't, they're, they, they, it's, they don't want to lose their family over. And that's usually the attitude that prevails. Um, it's, uh, it would be wonderful actually to have Wajdi come and speak himself, because as you can tell from those videos I gave, he's quite eloquent. Yes. Um, there's another question here from Linda, uh, who was in Tunisia and was told that the uh, Griba pilgrimage was related to Lagba Omer. Do you know anything about that? Have you heard anything about uh, that? No, I didn't know about that. The pilgrimage I know is held at the same time every year. I'm not, I'd have to check about Lagba Omer. That's, uh, that'd be interesting. The flags and the eggs are, and, the, and there's apples, but I'm not sure. No, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Uh, and maybe one last question more on a personal note, because you did mention that this trip uh, is changing your own trajectory uh, and kind of was really life-changing for you. So maybe you can say a few words uh, about that or what grabbed you so intensely and kind of where's right. your mind at after this trip? Uh, okay, well, uh, briefly, I'm, um, I've gone, most countries I go to, like uh, let's say Morocco, for instance, I get a narrative that I'm, ex that I'm kind of fed by everybody. Like Morocco with the king loves the Jews, save the Jews, the Muslims and the Jewish good. And it's and I'm not disparaging that. I don't want to start conspiracy thinking. But I've, I did notice that there's a whole other story. The Amazigh who are, who are the majority and they have their own na narrative and their own stories. And I became more and more intrigued by by the stories that are not told and 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 trying to find ways to start looking into the stories without without doing that typically suspicious well why don't we know about this and why don't we know about that it was i found that i found it very uh i found it wonderful that there's a matriarchal society that predominates in, in the in north africa that nobody knows about the amazi culture uh and it's uh and that just blew my mind it's it's taking me on, on this whole this painting behind me is done by an amazi woman it's uh there uh it's just i'm um yeah, it's a whole new journey for me. And, I, and I, there's a woman, I, I've told you another lecture, is called Kahina. She's an Amazigh, potentially Jewish woman, who actually, when the first 
Arabs from Arabia uh, came to invade and bring their Islam, type of Islam to Africa, North Africa, she started a counterfeit and she managed to defeat the first invaders for a good five years until finally she was defeated but uh, an incredible hero. And, and, the, and the North Africans are proud of her. They know about it. They see her as a sign of resistance, the Amazigh, not the Muslims. So it's a very, or not the, I should say the Arab Muslims consider themselves Arab background. It's a whole complicated, wonderful stories that are that need to be told. So I'm uh, that's that's what I'm talking about. So thank you very very much. Um, that was a beautiful journey and so unique to be able to see uh, to see Jerba uh, through your eyes um, with so much uh, curiosity and openness. Yeah, no, it just makes me want to go there. Uh, faster <laughs> and, that, and that food let me tell you the food is something else and it's even kosher for those uh, that yeah. so yeah this is this is a beginning of uh, more csp travels hopefully to tunisia and a lot of our i think um uh very special for ari and csp to to allow these like opening these channels mm -hmm. to more places that we don't necessarily get to hear about um kind of on a, on a regular basis. So uh, a moment to thank Ari here for allowing all of this to happen and for all of us to get all to right. learn so much. Thank you, David, for bringing it in such a beautiful way. Uh, we have more programs with you coming up at the end of this month where you'll be hosting uh, uh, Afnan Masawi, I think. So stay tuned uh, for more programs. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for being such an engaged uh, audience. It's wonderful to see your faces. You. Have Great a lovely you. day, afternoon, evening, or night. If I don't see you before Rosh Hashanah, Shana Tova, uh, and Leitot. It's not any time. Bye bye. bye.